like to call the City Council to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have all council here. Um, we have a motion to approve the agenda as amended. We have some changes. Um, item 1095. The okay, actually 1094. I apologize. <clears throat> uh, at the end, uh, item number two would be the estimated cost, which is a thousand forty-four five hundred nine dollars, would be for regular uh, time police and DPW services, and five hundred thirty-five of that would be overtime. And then item 1095 on the next page. The first line to have a beer tent on South Ann Arbor Street. And then also under discussion, additional cemetery spaces, which you'll see there's a, <coughs> a plan on a counter tonight that uh, our city clerk would like to talk to council about. Are there um, any other additions or changes to the agenda? We have a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Move to approve as amended, Mayor. Move moral. Second. Second, Ivy. <coughs> All favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Mm -hmm. Motion carries. Do you have a PowerPoint? No. Okay. I mean, we have no absences uh, tonight. Um, we have a presentation by Barb Fielter from the St. Joseph Mercy Celine Hospital. Thanks for coming. Thank you for um, letting me to have five minutes on your uh, agenda. I just wanted to come and say that St. Joseph Mercy Celine is here to serve the um, Celine community and the surrounding uh, area. Um, we are still open. Um, uh, due to the announcement we made about our inpatient services, many people think we're closed. But we are here. We're here to serve the community. Just uh, to give you a few facts about who we serve. We serve 30,000 people annually for lab visits um, at Celine as outpatient. We serve 30,000 people for um, radiology visits. That's including our 64 slice CAT scanner, ultrasound, general x ray, our brand new digital mammography machine, nuclear medicine, echo stress testing um, services. In addition to those, um, that's, so it's 30,000 lab, 30,000 radiology, 15,000 people come to our 24 hour emergency room department. It will be a freestanding ER um, come July 1st. We also serve 10,000 people a year for physical therapy and occupational therapy visits, all as outpatients. We also do another 3,000 surgeries um, there per year. We only serve, this, this uh, current year, we're going to serve less than 900 people uh, for inpatient services. It's less, it's, our inpatient census has dwindled over the years. Um, uh, our average daily census is less than 10 um, for the last two years. So it's a very, the inpatient business is a very small part of, of our business. Um, we are still going to be serving 89,000 people a year um, with outpatient services. Um, it's just just those um, 900 uh, people for inpatients that we're no longer able to serve um, come July 1st. So um, I'd be happy to field any questions anybody has about the hospital or the services that we um, are going to continue to provide um, to Celine and the surrounding areas. You um, just did an expansion or a realignment, I guess, maybe, is a, this last spring? Oh, with the building? The yeah, building project was our bit? community health pavilion in its... Um, uh, it improved wayfinding. It also provides us with a brand new community room in which we can um, expand our health um, and education wellness opportunities. With health reform, I think a key is going to be keeping people out of the hospital, not in the hospital. So education will be a big um, part of that, and that allows us to do that. It also improved um, it, our imaging services. Um, to the hospital, so. Are you going to be doing more public screening and stuff in that in that area? Or? Um, we are actually uh, forming a small group of people as an advisory group to help us determine what types of wellness activities would best serve Celine and the surrounding communities. Um, okay. So, to be determined. So that's Great. a good. Great. Thanks. Any questions? Barb. Okay. Hi, Barb. Hi. Thank you for presenting this evening. Uh, 
there is going to be a focus now on preventative medicine mm -hmm. at Saline Hospital, which we, we may not have had, uh, at least as an intense focus as, as we uh, will have. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on uh, how that's going to happen. What, what, what are we going to do differently? Um. Yeah, that is still being determined, but one of the things we did this spring was we had um, one of the key areas for Washtenaw County um, is um, obesity, the rates of obesity. And so we had um, a keynote speaker. We had Ron and Mike Morelli, who were on the Biggest Loser Season 7 show. And they came and gave a very inspiring talk to about 200 people that attended that day um, on weight loss. And then we had... Um, uh, uh, kind of a health fair in the rest of the hospital offering di uh, blood pressure screenings and cholesterol screenings and offering um, health education around the food we eat. So I definitely uh, feel that um, when we did some health, uh, community focus groups in the past year, obesity and diabetes came to the top of both forums as issues in our community. So again, we'll form this small group <coughs> an advisory to help us select topics um, on education um, to help people, but definitely I see that as, that as a key um, a key need in our community and a kind of a national focus as well. Thank you, Barb. This facility is still going to become uh, a very important uh, part of, of our community, and I, I, I thank you again for uh, being here tonight to explain that. Correct, and uh, we look forward to serving the Saline and surrounding communities for many years to come. Great. Thank okay. you. Any, Mr. Um, <clears throat> on the uh, subject of community health and, and education, perhaps one suggestion <coughs> could be a to develop a closer working relationship between the hospital and the Pick Up the Pace Saline group. Okay. That local group called PUPS where you put on community walks and, and bike rides and advocate for um, safe routes to schools and more healthy uh, food programs in the schools. Seems like there would be an, uh, a good tie there between okay. those two groups. Okay. Um, we, we would look forward to working with that group. You're on. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Any other? Thanks a lot. Appreciate your coming in. Uh, citizen comments on agenda items on the Open Meetings Act. Any citizen may come for at this time and make comment or question on items that appear on this agenda. Comments will be limited to three minutes per person, and the citizen comment period will be limited to a total of 45 minutes. Anyone who would like to speak is requested but not required to state his or her name and address for the record. Is there anyone that would like to speak to anything on the agenda? Mary Huss, 600 Canterbury. And uh, my remarks are regarding right-of-ways, walkways, and uh, the easements that we've been giving to public businesses. Uh, the one I, and you will be on the agenda tonight. I have uh, pictures of one of the areas, which is uh, Brecon Grill, and uh, on our walkways, I think that uh, the tree grills are a trip hazard, and they also are a trip hazard for canes and for high heels, for little animals. May I give you these pictures to look at during the meeting, as far as because we do have other things. The front is my favorite cafe, which has small chairs, and they only have two, and there's a nice walking distance. Uh, Mr. Uh, Breck and Grill apparently has had a re uh, permit. Their permit on the front said they wanted to have eight tables, and then they, uh, that's what they applied for, but they were given ten tables. If you take the multiplication of four tables on the front on Michigan Avenue and ten up to ten on uh, South uh, Saline, uh, that times and plus four up to four chairs, that's 56 people, plus there's two benches in the front which would accommodate four, that would come up to 60 seating. That's almost as much that's on the inside. My sidewalk has to be by law five feet, yet we're allowing a 36 inch pathway. If someone's coming this way and someone's going that way, who gets to get off of the curb and get in the street? 
I was on council, as you know, over 20 years. And if I was going to err, it would be err on the safety. Uh, in the codes, codes there is uh, Article <coughs> 1 5, Sidewalk Construction and Repair. I ask that all these trip hazards be fixed that are in, uh, on the South Myland. And also that the uh, council please take time and uh, take two of you and walk the opposite way and see that it's not a, it's an obstacle hazard. There's no way a wheelchair, electrical wheelchair, which I'm sure maybe Lisa would help me as far as going over this area. And, and I know that permission has been given by the council, of which MDOT's given the permission, but the four chairs on Michigan Avenue, they're chaining up to the light pole to where when the incline on the corner goes down. I'm hoping that the council would readdress that again. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, John Olson, uh, President of the Downtown Merchants Association. Uh, this year I'm President of the Chamber of Commerce and uh, also the owner of Spotted Dog Winery. A um, couple things I wanted to address on the agenda. Um, first off, I would encourage Council to please um, grant approval for Dan's downtown. Um, we find it very exciting to have the outdoor seating and to have the energy that it creates. Um, you know, you can have a ton of people inside, but if the streets look dead, the streets look dead. You go through Ann Arbor, it's an excitement, and we're very happy to see another outdoor seating being made available to, to people. Um, the second thing is um, on the agenda will be to uh, do approval for the uh, cure event that's coming downtown. Um, the folks here have come to us and the Merchants Association is uh, gladly embracing this as a very exciting event that we hope will continue for years to come. Um, it will typically when we start a new event, we count in our hopes in hundreds. <coughs> we're actually going to count our hopes in thousands. Um, so we are very excited to have this. Uh, we will be working as closely as we can with them to try and help them get through the whole process and I would like to request that that uh, council consider waiving the fees for this event as uh, what will be a very fantastic event for the uh, for the city and as I said for many years to come um, Paul is working with them with the uh, food tent and all the things that are going to go on with that and I don't know if you guys have anything you want to say about the event itself but uh, we've gone around to the merchants and they are very very excited just in regards to the fees, um, these come out of the donations that are actually going to be going to Susan G. Coleman. So we're kind of asking for your support in that aspect and donating them. Um, this is a great publicity for the city. We're actually expecting over 5,000 people. Um, six Tiger players have confirmed that they're going to be here all day signing autographs. Um, and so they're on board. Tiger Foundation has been wonderful to work with. They're helping. They're donating paws. So paws will be here for the children. Um, but this really is about the Susan G. Coleman event, and we want to donate as much as we can to them. And to pay $900 in fees, that's quite a bit of money that's going to be coming out of our profit that day. So we ask that you take that into consideration. Um, there is a lot of promotion going into this event, so we would love to say that the City of Saline has been super supportive and promote the city as much as we can, like you guys have been so far. And if you have any questions for us, I mean, feel, please feel free to act. We've been working very hard on this. So it's exciting. So, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> Any other citizen comment? Now we'll move on to the consent agenda. Following consent agenda will normally be adopted without discussion. However, at the request of any citizen or council member, any item may be removed from the, from the consent agenda for council discussion. Move to approve as submitted. Roads. Second. Second, Ivy. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 
Motion carries. <coughs> Under public hearings, item 1053, the 2010-2011 Fiscal Year General Appropriations Act or Budget, this is a motion to acknowledge receipt of the May 26, 2010 memo from Finance Director Burgoyne regarding General Appropriations Act for Fiscal Year 11. Do you have a motion? I move to acknowledge receipt. Second. Moral, second. Law? Mr. Burgoyne? <coughs> Well, this uh, budget has the same uh, millage rate as the prior year and uh, <coughs> provides for all services uh, from the city, its share of fire, uh, refuse, uh, solid waste pickup, and all other services. The only thing it doesn't cover a couple of years down the road will be um, there will come a point in about two years where we run out of the street bond funds. And at that point, we'll have to address that. But for now, in the next couple of years, it's pretty stable. It's the same tax rate. Are there any questions for Mr. Burgoyne? Well, at this point, we've spent probably four months talking about this, so there's not much conversation at this point, but um, appreciate uh, staff's hard work on getting to this place because I know it took a lot and also council, we had a lot of work sessions and spent a lot of time on this. So um, if there's no further discussion on the motion to acknowledge receipt, receive, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Say no. Motion carries. And we need a motion to open the public hearing. Move to open. Move Ivy. Second. Second ping. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Public hearing is now open. Is there anyone like to speak to this issue? Move to close. Move law. Do we have a second? Support. Second road to close the public hearing. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> public hearing is now closed. This would be a motion to approve and adopt or not adopt the resolution as submitted adopting the General Appropriations Act or the budget for fiscal year 2010 to 2011. Providing for a general operating millage of 13.524 mills, including the funding required for fire protection. 2001 street debt millage of 0.1118 mills. 2004 street debt millage of 0.4022 mills. And a refuse millage of 1.492 mills. For a total millage levy of 15.53 mills, which is the same total city millage as the prior year. So moved. Second. Adopt, uh, approve and adopt. <coughs> Move to approve and adopt. Do we have a second? Second. Ms. Ping. Um, I just have a question about the way I know that we talked about this at a work session, and this is great how this is broken out here, but is it going to show that in our tax bill this time? Yeah. Um, <coughs> yes, and, and um, I believe that was went in as a hard copy, so I, I think it went out after your packets did. But we do have, um, we did send around uh, probably getting in this week's packet, but there'll be a detail on the back side that with the other details from the other jurisdictions if that, and, and basically sending it around to council to see if that's agreeable <coughs> but it, it breaks out our street debt our specific street that was that was what we were, had been directed to do on the front side there's um, there's a little room however to if we were to insert that um, there would be a little bit of some time and cost to reconfigure the database that it's configured on um, but um, but again, all the other jurisdictions are just their, their summary, if you will. And then the back side of that tax bill is the detail of the specific. So it'll say um, uh, city of Saline, say operating um, uh, street debt, or a street bond or street debt, and um, solid waste. OK, the, the, my only concern is um we, you know, when we talked about it before, is letting people know the difference between kind of the general operating and what was voter approved debt um, separate for that. And people already think that when they write their tax bill, most people don't flip it over to look at how it's broken out. And they think that they're paying all their taxes to the city when in fact, you know, a, just a portion of it goes to the city and it goes to all the other jurisdictions also. So if I, I really, it would, be my opinion that if there's any way you can get it on the front so that it can be broken down um, you know we send out the bills it's our tax bill so we can obviously we can do whatever we want but I think that it would be great if it were on there so that people knew exactly what our 
that our general operating millage is the 13.5240, not the total 15.5553. Correct. So, anyway, okay, thank you. Further discussion on motion, Mr. Law? I'll just comment about piggybacking on what you stated earlier, Mayor, that uh, congratulate the staff and uh, and for council really for the hard work again on this year. And not only is this the rate that we had last year, it's the rate we had for the last five years. So I think that's duly noted, and I think it's uh, a testament really to uh, how hard the staff works and has worked in the past to keep the millage at least stable, and especially in these uh, hard economic times that we're certainly all well aware of. So again, uh, good job to the staff for, uh, for a job well done. Mr. Morrow. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Campbell, uh, pardon my naivete, and I've been meaning to ask this for some time. If uh, citizens want to review the budget in its entirety, where do they go? They can receive a, a hard copy from, from, go ahead, I'm sorry, Mr. Burgoyne. Um, the uh, budget for the past 10 days has been at the library uh, in, uh, reference desk and also has <coughs> been out in the lobby here next to the police desk and uh, the small rotating uh, bookshelf out there. So we always put it there a couple of weeks before we get to this meeting. What, and then do those documents, once that document is approved and adopted, does it remain at the library reference desk and out in the hallway? <coughs> yes, it's there the historically, year? the historical okay. ones are at the library, not up here. Yeah, and just sort of a follow-up, and this is more rhetorical than anything else, but has there been any thought invested into trying to get a lot of our financial documents and budget online? We, we do put the documents online at the end, but with um, the preliminary version we have here in the lobby and at the library. But at the end, we have it online. The entire budget is yes. online? Yep. Okay. Thank you. And the report that shows the trends and the, that. Right, the printed document also is online. One that's easier to read to understand the direction the city's heading in. <laughs> there's one that's just numbers, and then there's one that has text in it and sort of it talks and about charts it all. and graphs, and that one is yeah, online on. too. Good. Thank you, Mayor. Any further discussion on this motion, Mr. Ivy? Uh, question for uh, either Mr. Burgoyne or Mr. Campbell. If you could maybe point out a couple of uh, key reasons why the city has been able to hold the line on the millage rate once again. Well, I'll take a quick shot and then Lee, because he's been here, obviously I've been here, so my, I guess my third budget. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of belt tightening, if you will, um, in the past few years, the concern of ACH closing and, and obviously I've been very fortunate that um, they are doing very well now, and, and hopefully that will continue on. But that was a big part of it, um, holding on to <coughs> some expenses as, as well as, as uh, um, being very frugal when it comes to capital improvements, capital investments, still keeping up with the minimums. But um, um, as well as the, this most recent one, well, I guess actually the current budget year that we're in now, as well as the one that will begin <coughs> July 1, through the unfortunate layoffs, elimination of positions last year, mm -hmm. and then um, combining uh, of a position of two positions this year has helped, um, uh, as well as uh, we did the couple. We did two. Um, well, actually, I guess one is uh, more focused on the general fund, but two uh, bond refundings has helped us. Refinancing of those bonds has helped us save as well. And then, I don't know if I missed anything, Lee. But yes, um, I would say. Um, uh, layoffs of about 8% of the workforce. That's one thing. Uh, several years ago, we had a wage freeze. Um, over the course of time, within the past few years, um, we've reduced the richness of the health care programs, and we look for various ways to do that, and that's still underway. Um, thing, things like that in belt, belt tightening. Well, th thank you both. Uh, I, I would uh, agree with my colleague, Mr. Law, that uh, city staff has done a, a commendable job in the process. This is, I think, the third budget process that I've been involved with, and things went very smoothly, and uh, I'm very pleased with the results. 
Mr. Little. Well, I, I think all those things have been good factors, but the reality is we haven't gone out and spent money on things we can't afford. And I think that's that should be the rule forever <laughs> in the day, whether whether no matter what the uh, tax revenues are. Yeah, and I, as uh, Mr. Campbell pointed out, we were expecting a very large facility in our community to close uh, 2010. So that was we tar we figured it was nine percent of our revenue. So we've been planning for that, and instead of closing. They put $100 million in the facility, and then they're adding another 50. Is it another 50 million they're planning on adding? 30. 30. It's come down a little bit. Well, it's, it's, but they're going, going it's hard to tell. And, that's you know, and that would be the ACH plan, but they are running full, full speed ahead, full shifts, and full parking lot. So they're <coughs> at the highest employment they've been in quite some time. So we, we've been very fortunate, as I've been telling other mayors and city managers around the state and other cities lost with it. Celine's been very fortunate to take on business from other communities that actually lost facilities. So we've been very fortunate that way and I know a lot of that has to do with the work that um, we do in the community staff does to reach out and have a good partnership with them. So <coughs> is there any further discussion on the motion? If not, we have a motion to approve and adopt the resolution adopting the General Appropriations Act. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 1093, this is the application for special land approval. Dan's Downtown Tavern, the special land use is applied for is to allow the use of the property at 103 East Michigan Avenue, Saline, for an outdoor cafe service area at the rear of the property, which is not on Michigan Avenue, in a C1 Central Business di District. This is Saline City Tax Code 18-18-01-110-004 and 18-18-01-110-006. So it will be a motion to acknowledge receive the June 1st, 2010 memo from the Saline City Planning Commission, the May 19th, 2010 report from City Superintendent Engineer Rubel, the May 20th, 2010 memo from Building Inspector Taylor, the May 3rd, 2010 memo from City Treasurer Bennett, the May 14th, 2010 email from Fire Chief Teff, the May 3rd, 2010 email from Police Chief Button, and the June 2nd, 2010 memo from City Superintendent Engineer Rubel regarding hours of operation consideration. Move to acknowledge the receipt. Second. Move road, second ping. Is there any questions? There's no questions on all the memos for any of the staff that's here tonight. All in favor of the motion to acknowledge receipt, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. And we need a motion to open the public hearing. So moved. Moved, moved open. Move ping, second moral. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Public hearing is now open. Is there anybody that would like to speak to this issue? Mary has 600 Canterbury. And if you wouldn't mind speaking up, my hearing is starting to go. And I know that's why we got the microphones and Todd is kind of soft and you're soft and it'd be appreciative if we could see it. Uh, I noticed that on his request he has a 5.6 to 6 foot access pathway. I have two uh, things that I want to ask as far as is smoking allowed outside where there is food no. on any of these uh, permissions of right no. away, okay? No. The other thing is uh, in section 74187 liability for damage due to faulty sidewalk and uh, then there's a section 74186 duty to maintain sidewalks if in fact that area should have a faulty area who would be responsible for fixing it and who has the liability other than I think it's a good plan it's a good area <coughs> is that a question that can be okay we'll answer that Is there any further public comment? Hi. <clears throat> My name is Larry Oster. I'm with, the Celine, <clears throat> I'm with the Celine Area Chamber of Commerce, as most of you know, I hope. Um, <clears throat> just a few quick comments, and they are brief. But um, this is my 10th year with the Chamber, and it's taken us, um, I'm really pleased that it's taken us a long time, but yet we're starting to show some progress in terms of signs of life in our downtown. And um, as all of you know, we went through the Hyatt Palma study. We've <coughs> dealt with our empty buildings. 
Um, Michigan Avenue is a challenge, and um, the Chamber has worked closely with the BDA and the Downtown Merchants Association to see that good things happen, and I'm proud to say they are now happening. Uh, one of those is, of course, the outdoor dining. It's nice to see people outside. Um, I think it adds a lot of ambiance. It adds a lot of credibility to our downtown for having things going on. So I credit our um, Dance Tavern as well as Breckham Grill. Um, <clears throat> even Max is doing some outdoor dining in the summertime when the weather permits. So uh, all those things in perspective and in the larger scope of things, I think on behalf of the chamber and I think of just about everyone here, we're very pleased to see the kind of progress that we're making in terms of having outdoor activity and more things going on in our downtown. Let's keep up the good work. Is there any other public comment? Move to close. We also have a memo that everybody has that was received on May 25th from a resident in the area. So we have a motion to close by Morrow. Second, Mr. Little. to close the public hearing say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. The public hearing is now closed. Um, Mr. Campbell or Mr. Rubel, can you answer the question that was brought up under um, public, public comment regarding the uh, fixing the sidewalk and the liability? Or would that be Mr. Grossman? Well, I'd be happy to try to do that. Um, <coughs> <clears throat> this particular property uh, is, is really quite different than uh, the other um, <clears throat> sidewalk cafes. We're calling this a sidewalk cafe. Actually, it's not. There's no, there's no, no city land is being, uh, we're not allowing uh, the public to use city land. Uh, the, the city right-of-way, the street and the sidewalk, is, of course, the city's responsibility and uh, would remain so here. <coughs> this property is at the back of the buildings <coughs> that face to the south on US-12. <coughs> and in back, uh, there is some space back there uh, that we're talking about putting some tables and chairs. So the, the, per the liability would fall on the user and or owner who is responsible for the upkeep of that area. And then if the owner left uh, the, the, that area in disrepair, in such a manner so that someone was injured by that disrepair, uh, it would be the owner or the, or the person uh, in, ch in charge of keeping up the, uh, the, the repairs on the, on the area. But not the city, because the city's uh, liability extends only to the sidewalk. And this does not use any part of the public sidewalk. The public sidewalk runs north and south on Ann Arbor Street <clears throat> past this property, but it doesn't touch it. Well, it, it's adjacent to it, but it doesn't cross it. Do you want to add anything, Mr. Campbell? No, I, I think um, he addressed that appropriately, and I know in conversations with uh, the Colanders that, I mean, that's their intent is obviously is to keep it up, and, and, um, and obviously it only behooves their business to do that. So. Question for you. The, the bricks that are laid back there, they're all popping up. Those are not laid by us. So, who fixes those with the leather? They fluctuate with the hot and cold. And they're sticking up about this part. I think that's what Mary was talking about. They're, they've actually come up about right to the inch. There's a brick back there that's, uh, the water doesn't drain properly. So, we take care of that or we clean it for the men. That's on uh, behind Joy's plant house there. So I think some people can triple that. Okay. Seems to be, I mean, it's, I don't know, We really can't, um, because we're televised, if you have comments here, you need to come to the microphone because people that are watching the meeting later can't hear if you're not at the microphone. So, but I think that would be an issue that. Um, City, I think there would need to be a meeting with uh, the city engineer or and, and or the city manager to discuss the, that issue in particular. So, absolutely, we, and we will we'll get together and determine that and, and figure that out. <coughs> so uh, we would have a motion here to grant or deny the special land use approval applied for by Dan Colander 
owner of Dan's Downtown Tavern to allow the use of the property at 103 East Michigan Avenue Saline for an outdoor cafe service area at the rear of the property not on Michigan Avenue in a C1 Central Business District subject to the following conditions. One, the outdoor cafe service area for 103 East Michigan Avenue shall comply with the seven provisions of section 6.09 zoning. Two, the outdoor cafe service shall comply <coughs> with the site plan and conditions. And three, hours for outside service are allowed until 11 p.m. Move to grant. Second. Move moral second, Ivy to grant. Discussion. discussion well I was at the Planning Commission meeting and um, also I know that uh, the Colanders know that I'm very supportive of outdoor dining and have been trying to promote that in the downtown area for quite a while so I'm actually very happy to see that you're willing to make an additional investment in your property and uh, bring more people to our community to eat and um, I think the Non-smoking will be actually a benefit, ultimately, although I'm sure we're having some transition area uh, issues. Um, we did actually talk about that a little bit when we were walking around downtown on uh, Friday in preparation for our BDA meeting tomorrow. And I think we probably need to talk about having some containers for people to have location for their cigarettes since they can't. So I think um, that's another thing that you should probably talk with the property owners that have non-smoking now entities because that is an issue right now the cigarettes butts where they go and I think that's going to continue to be a problem as we transition <coughs> through that this phase of not being allowed to smoke where people have been normally have been used to doing that so but I personally am very supportive of um, having uh, outdoor seating and again as our chamber director said it's great because it really shows the vitality of our downtown and a lot more activity going on so thank you for making the effort um, is there a further discussion? All in favor to grant say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We have item B under this motion is outdoor service area for Deans Downtown Tavern. This is a motion to acknowledge receive the local approval notice received April 29, 2010 from the Michigan Liquor Control Commission and the June 3, 2010 memo from City Clerk Hill to approve and adopt or not adopt the resolution as submitted recommending to the Michigan Liquor Control Commission that the request from the Saline Taverns Incorporated DBA Dan's Downtown Tavern for a new outdoor service, one area, to be held in conjunction with the 2010 Class C licensed business located at 103 East Michigan Avenue, which is at the rear of the property, <coughs> Saline, Michigan, be approved or not approved. We have a motion? Move to approve and adopt and approve. Second. Move roads to approve and adopt and approve. Second ping. Discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Under new business, item 1094, community event, use of public ways, the senior citizen parade. This is a motion to acknowledge receipt of the application for community event, use of public ways, submitted by Kathy Mammel on behalf of the Mill Pond Manor for a senior citizen parade to be held on Saturday, September 18, 2010. To acknowledge receipt of the May 3, 2010 memo from Police Chief Button, the May 14, 2010 email from Fire Chief Heft, and the June 1, 2010 memo from Public Works Director Fordyce. To approve or not approve the senior citizen parade to be held on September 18, 2010, utilizing West Bennett, Mills Road, and West Russell Streets, subject to the following conditions. One, that a certificate of insurance be provided by Mill Pond Manor, with the City of Saline listed as an endorsed additional insured party for this event. Two, that the traffic engineer issue the required temporary traffic control orders with the estimated cost of $1,044, $509 of which is regular pay for police and DPW, and 535 is for overtime for this event. Over and above the normal operating costs be waived or paid by the applicant. We have a motion. I'll, I'll move. approve and waive. Uh, okay. All right, well, so I'll not second move. that. No, I, I would uh, prefer that we move the costs over and above normal operating costs be paid by the applicant. Well, so do we have a second. a second on one of those motions? <laughs> Since they both came out at the same time. <laughs> Never had that happen to me before. First time for everything. Okay, maybe there's no motion on the floor. <clears throat> we have a second on a motion. I'll second that to Boy approve and waive. So we have a second uh, to approve, approve, approve and waive. And waive waive every, in total? Yeah. Okay. We have Blue Road Second Law to approve uh, the parade and waive all fees. Discussion. 
Mr. Ivey. Uh, I, I'm just opposed to uh, bearing the cost of, of this uh, event, which is, uh, I believe, a new event. We haven't had this before, and uh, that, that's a substantial amount of money to uh, add to the burden of the uh, of the costs that, that we already have. So I, I'm going to oppose it on that uh, point. Ms. Ping. I guess I'm wondering um, what the the purpose is, or what kind of groups would be involved in this parade, uh, it, because we have the fair parade that will happen about two weeks before that, and then the homecoming parade that's going to happen about two weeks after this. I think we have that. So here, okay. So you know, just because we have, we'll have like three parades in four weeks, in kind of some small areas, and so I'm just kind of. Well, you know Maybe we made top help. 100 for our parades, right? <laughs> what our quantity. Was so we're top 100 small city for our quantity of parades. <laughs> <laughs> and you must be Ms. Mammal? Yes, I am. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, this all started because it's the 20th anniversary of Mill Pond Manor and the 50th anniversary for Retirement Housing Foundation, which was the funding behind building Mill Pond Manor. Mill Pond Manor is a HUD subsidized facility for senior <coughs> citizens. Um, there's a great need for that facility in this area. We have a waiting list um, always with um, all of our 401ks going down the tubes, so to speak. Um, there is going to be a greater need for this kind of housing all the time. Um, I am from the west side of the state and have been living in St. Joseph, which is listed as the fourth best place to retire in the United States. St. Joseph doesn't have anything other than Lake Michigan, of course, that we don't have right here. We have good medical facilities. We have a great Celine Senior Citizen Center. We have phenomenal um, church and civic organizations who are willing to um, assist our seniors. But seniors are reluctant to ask for help and they're reluctant to make themselves known. So the purpose of this um, event is to let the community and <coughs> the area be more aware of what is here for senior citizens and also to give the seniors an opportunity to showcase that they're not sitting in a rocking chair knitting the day away. They're vibrant, they're contributing members to the community. We have volunteers of every kind in our communities and so that's why we decided that it would be beneficial to have an event that is just for seniors. It is true there are other parades going on, but most of the other parades focus on the young people in the community. And while that's very important, and I would be the last one to go against that, I do believe that it's important for seniors to have an opportunity to <coughs> promote themselves. We are um, planning the parade to include two bands that are um, senior citizen members only. We have um, seniors on motorcycles that want to come. We have seniors in motorized wheelchairs that are very excited about this. So that's why we're asking for a separate parade, something that is just for the seniors. Is this a one-time only for the anniversary, or are you planning well, we'll to see. annual? You know, if we get a, a good response, we would like to do this yearly. It's been interesting to see how excited the seniors in the area are about this. I expected um, to see a lot of opposition and a lot of um, reluctance on the part of seniors saying, oh, we just are too tired, we can't do this. Seniors aren't that way. They are so excited for an opportunity to have something that's just for them. So are you partnering with the senior center then? We're partnering with the senior citizen, senior mm, citizen center, mm -hmm. too many S's there, um, with Brecken and with the EVH. Oh great, okay. As well as the UCC churches and the <coughs> general south 
eastern Michigan area because um, our foundation was founded by the <coughs> UCC Church. Mm -hmm. Mr. Long. Um, before I get on to my crux of my remarks to the applicant, Lake Michigan is big. <laughs> I, I would trade that, some but... of Lake Michigan for here. Mm -hmm. you know, all the things we have in Celine, give me a bit of Lake Michigan. And St. Joseph's uses it quite well. I've been there. It's really, but I, point well taken, I agree with you. Celine has a lot. And on the motion itself, well, with respect to Councilmember Ivy, uh, trust me, I've, I've thought of this battle over uh, waiving fees. And um, in this case, uh, and any other case, this is for the community. And if we w don't waive the fees for this, then we're going to have to look at, <coughs> excuse me, going to have to look at the fair, pro uh, fair parade, uh, Memorial Day parade, or any other parade. Um, this is for the community, and it's for the benefit of the community. And really, when you look at it, in the grand scheme of things, the benefits outweigh the negatives or, you know, the cost, in my opinion. Thank you. Mr. Morrow. Thank you, Mayor. I want to second what my <coughs> colleague, Mr. Law, says. In fact, we as a, as a council, as a city, have sort of an unwritten policy that um, over the years we have waived fees for all applicants um, who are petitioning to have community events and use the public right-of-ways. So I would find it to be extremely <coughs> disingenuous to deny this applicant and not waive the fees. And um, yeah, I, I understand the issue. I understand the mentality. However, uh, I'm cognizant of the fact that the fees we're talking about here could not be described um, as substantial. So I think this is important. I applaud you for being proactive and organized this, and I encourage a yay vote on the motion. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Ivey. In view of the applicant's presentation, I'm going to rescind my objection uh, to the uh, waiving of the fees. Uh, I have a better understanding now of uh, what uh, the intention uh, of the uh, Mill Pond Manor senior citizens uh, is, and, and I'm, I'm going to go along with this, uh, and I agree with my colleagues, uh, Mr. Law and Mr. Morrow, that uh, if by making an exception now, we may uh, have a can of worms later. So I, I'm going to uh, go along with the motion that's on the floor. Thank you. Mr. Little. Uh, a couple things. One, this really is there's no cash outlay for the city for this event. And secondly, um, we review each, we, we, we tend to uh, approve these events and not, uh, if, they're, if it's a good cause and a safe cause, but we, we tend to waive the fees. But we review each and every one in case sure. there is a situation where someone wants to come in and have a parade that would be detrimental to the community. So uh, we, uh, while it seems like we have a blanket, uh, okay, we don't. Yeah. Um, and lastly, I hope you'll invite Mayor Mark Hopper to the event because without Mark Hopper, uh, there wouldn't have been a Mill Pond Manor. The hard work he did here and the hard work he did in Washington to make that happen. <coughs> yes, I will. Thank you. Thanks. On Mr. Little's note, uh, although he can't be invited, God rest his soul, I hope we remember a Congressman Bill Ford because I think he was also instrumental in helping us secure Mill Pond Manor. So. Point well taken. Yeah. I don't know if you had you a know, chance. Those, uh, Did you? Blue Dog Democrats are always good here. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a chance to introduce yourself? Because I think you're I relatively new to the community, so yes. it's great for you, you to have um, an opportunity to introduce yourself. We are, our meetings are televised, so I think it would be great for people to know sure. who I'm you Kathy are. Sure. I'm Kathy Mammel. Thank you. I am the new manager director of Mill Pond Manor. Great. Thank you. And I just want to point out, I. Um, I'm all about community, and I think parades just bring, you know, I'm always trying to get more block parties going. I know Chief knows about that. But um, uh, the city clerk was just pointing out to me that we used to have a homecoming parade that was very similar in that it wound to our neighborhood. And um, we don't have that anymore because our high school is now outside the city limits, and it's, there aren't really neighborhoods that we can wind through anymore. So I think this is going to be replacing our homecoming parade in a very nice way. So thank you for coming up with the idea. I think it's very creative, and I look forward to seeing fun parade. It's actually right around the corner from where I live. So, Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments on this motion? <coughs> so we have a motion to approve <coughs> and waive. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 1095, community event, use of public ways, bid for the Cure fundraiser event. 
There's a motion to acknowledge receive the May 26, 2010 memo from downtown director Art Trapp and the revised application for community event use of public ways from Paul Garagosian for a fundraiser event bid for a cure to be held on July 1, 2010. To acknowledge receipt of the May 24, 2010 memo from Public Works Director Fordyce, the May 25, 2010 memo from Fire Chief Heft, and the May 21, 2010 memo from Police Chief Button. To approve or not approve this fundraising event, bid for the cure to be held on July 1, 2010, with author authorization to close South Ann Arbor Street from Michigan to Henry, <coughs> and use, use of the east portion of parking lot number four, subject to the following conditions. One, that a certificate of insurance be provided by the applicant with the city of Saline listed as an endorsed additional insured party for this event. Two, that the traffic engineer issue the required traffic control orders. Three, that a permit for closing of the left turn lane be obtained from MDOT. And uh, to, appro to approve or not approve G9 Taverns DBA <coughs> Wrecking Grill to have a beer tent on South Ann Arbor Street subject to the Mi Michigan Liquor Control Commission issuing the required license for this one day event with liquor liability insurance to be provided by G9 Taverns Incorporated with the city listed as an in endorsed additional insured party for this event and further that all costs and fees directly related to this event be paid for by the applicant estimated at $947. Move to approve, approve, but I'd like the cost to be waived. <coughs> second. second. Mr. Law. Again, just for my earlier discussion, our point about the, uh, the manor parade, this again on the fees. Um, again, this is a benefit for the community, a benefit for a cause more than a community, but certainly it affects a great many people in the community, which I guess is what I'm trying to say. So um, it all goes together and all cor correlates. So. Um, I really think that this is a great thing that's going to happen for the city, and uh, I look forward to its success. So further discussion, Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just if I could, if if uh, I don't know if Mr. Gregosian or, or anybody wanted to, just one of the issues, um, uh, Art Trap, our downtown development director, he's been helping them uh, work these things out. But one of the, the the things that I would like, I guess, a little more. Um, understanding is it's my understanding with um, that the event will finish at 11 o'clock that night that Thursday night but then the tent will, would at this point in time would remain <coughs> in the street um, <coughs> until sometime maybe 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning the next day so the road would continue to be closed throughout that whole time um, and it's also my understanding that certainly they've done their due diligence and they've talked to the area businesses but my understanding is area businesses have said we want the um, we want the street open if there's nothing going on because the other thing is we, the city will be closing it um, about five o'clock that night for downtown music series um, so I just want to and it's it's my I mean the only I think the only business that would be directly affected um, in the early morning prior to say eight or nine o'clock would be my favorite cafe because they come on that early morning I think I believe they open at 730 um, so I just ask that they address that um, if because my concern is if, if it remains closed is that gonna have a detrimental effect on downtown business so I guess the key question is have you contacted all the abutting store fronts uh, Paul Gregosi from the Breck and Grill um, we have, as, as the Downtown Merchant Association, gone around to the area businesses and asked for their support of this event. Um, prior to this meeting, talking with, with our John, 10, 11 o'clock at night, there's no businesses open that are going to be being hindered by the road being closed at that, at that hour. Um, I understand that my favorite cafe will be um, being affected by that road being closed at the 7.30 hour in the morning. But I think his benefit from the day's events prior to that, and I'm sure that, you know, talking with Brian again and maybe getting, you know, s some feedback from him as well, but would be uh, outweighing the hindrance that it would cause on, on the following morning. Now, I do know that the, the uh, 10 people have offered to say that they can Til 10 they take can the, 10 they can take the tent down at 10 o'clock at night on Thursday that would shorten the, the hours of the event itself if that's something that's going to be required at the city that would take the tent down or 8 o'clock the following morning 
uh, that I, it could be taken. I don't see well. it as a requirement unless you have property owner, you know, store store owners that have an issue with it staying up overnight. And I think it's incumbent as a new event that you know. Yeah, I think it's a great event for the city. I mean, obviously, um, as one of the business owners in town, it's going to benefit me as well as Spotted Dog and my favorite cafe. And hey, Marty could have a barbershop chair out on the on the sidewalk giving a haircut and maybe, you know, and <laughs> benefit him as well. I mean, to, to bring some humor to it, but it's, in all seriousness, bringing that many people down in, to our downtown is really my understanding what the city of Selene wants to do to grow as a city, and we're just attempting to bring that type of event downtown. Well, the other thing is that the tent will be in the street, that whole parking lot will be open, so people can just pull right up and just walk across the street and get their coffee. So really all it's stopping them from is pulling up in front. I don't think, I think with the business they do the day before, they'd be more than happy to give up an hour in the morning. But can you just clarify with the property I owners? can do that. I've already spoken to them, and they are more than excited about the event, because when the events are right out front of their place, they always do so well. So whenever we tell them about it, they get all excited, staff up, and, you know, the whole thing. So I will verify that. But when I told them about it the first time, they did not have any problems. Any questions or comments from council for the applicant? Mr. Rhodes. I think it's a great event. My only uh, potential concern is whether or not you're going to have enough room to accommodate somewhere between 2,000 and 5,000 people. What, what are you going to do if that many folks show up? And well, I think it's, little an space. Day, it's being an all-day event as well, so it's not going to be just 5,000 people all at once. Um, <laughs> of course, that would be a great thing if that, if that happened. But I guess, you know, um, with the... With the uh, <coughs> perimeter of, of the parking lot and the street being fenced off and having two entrances and two exits available that are manned and, and you know, working with the city to say, hey, we can have, you know, counting to try to figure out how many people are going to be in that to keep it as, at a safe number. If it gets to be 5,000 people, I think, you know, you're going to have the uh, Murphy's Crossing courtyard filled, you're going to have John's door filled, you're going to have Dan's <coughs> courtyard or sidewalk seating filled, Breck and Grill filled. I mean, I think, again, I don't think all 5,000 people will be there at one time. <coughs> Mr. Little. I would suggest in your literature uh, that you indicate where the parking lots are around downtown so that people know rather than having them cruise and look sure. at it and stuff. Right and also that they hopefully wouldn't, that the neighbor, neighborhood, uh, residential part of the neighborhoods wouldn't be overburdened with parking. Now, Pat, when you... Uh, we have a PDF of a map. We're in, involved Art. with, or are involved with the Celtic Festival, and they do the shuttles and so forth. That's something that I just thought of at, at the moment. Now, but you're shuttling from other parking lots, whether it be the, the schools. And so well, yeah. The school if you, if the schools get permission to use um, use their their campus parking lots, then uh, that's what we use uh, for parking. Uh, it, you know, you you could go to the schools and see if that's possible. And you certainly could look into. Um, uh, arranging for shuttle buses. Um, if you want, I could hook you up with a guy who does this for the Celtic Festival and he has it all in a row, so. We'll bring the shuttle. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And you could get the map of the parking lot, the PDF we have? Yeah. Can we can do that, but also I believe the DMA has a very nice okay. uh, piece of literature. I just want to say thank you. I think this is going to be a fantastic event. I know that we've talked about it before, but you know, it's at this point, it's more than just Breck and Grill and, and the organizers or Susan G. Komen and, you know, your hard work. It's the whole Downtown Merchants Association that's kind of come together. And I think when you can get a whole area, community, group of people to buy in and support and work on an event, just is going to make it so successful. So I hope that you get the big crowd that, that you're hoping for and uh, that you have great turnout and raise lots of money. Well, one thing that they keep bringing up to us is the focus on the kids. The, kids, the baseball kids in town, I know I've had a lot of years with baseball here in Selene, and um, I think it would be great for the kids. It's very exciting. So thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Just a discussion. Okay. Uh, we have a motion on the floor to approve. Uh, authorize, approve, and waive. Is there further discussion on this motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries.
Um, we're going to move item 1097 because I see our superintendent of schools is here up in front of the 1051 because 1051 is going to go for a little while and I know that you work long hard hours and you have a family at home that likes to see you around when they can. So if that would be okay with the rest of the council, okay. Ten, item 1097 is a lease agreement with Selene Area Schools, use of city property for education and recreational programs. It's a motion to acknowledge receive the June 1st, 2010 memo from C. Manager Campbell to approve or not approve the five-year lease agreement between the city of Selene and Selene Area Schools for the school's use of an approximate eight, five areas, five acres of city-owned property located between the west end of the Selene High School facility and the north end of the Selene High School's athletic complex for $1 per year. To authorize or not authorize the mayor and clerk to execute the lease agreement as prepared by Attorney Grossman. Move to approve and authorize. Support. Second. Move Ivy, second law, to approve and authorize. Discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, say hi to your family for us. <laughs> Um, item 1051, proposed ordinance number 727, a prohibiting uses for enterprises or purposes that are contrary to federal, state, or local laws or ordinances. This will be a presentation by City Manager Todd Campbell on the new Michigan medical marijuana law. <coughs> no. You may want to stretch your legs. <laughs> oh, is that right? You're the groupie? Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, this is, is we're trying to set this up. Make sure it's all on. It's going to take a second, but um, wanted to. Um, this is the same. Um, presentation that we gave to the Planning Commission a few weeks ago. This is in reference to the new Michigan Medical Marijuana Act uh, that was passed in uh, uh, November of 08. And um, gone to, I know, uh, City Attorney Grossman, as well as myself, as well as Chief Button and Deputy Chief Seal, have, we've all gone to different um, training sessions uh, uh, on this and for information. And um, the um, presentation that uh, we're going to provide, uh, as I said, the same one we provided to the Planning Commission, is a combination of three um, three presentations, and I believe uh, City Attorney Grossman and I both, on separate occasions, heard the same presentation. So it's, I wanted to, uh, we have our recommendation, uh, but I wanted to lay it all out so you all, so what other uh, communities are doing or not doing, and um, um, so we're, we're going to kind of tag team on this. So I apologize to take just a, just a minute here. But, um, and this is, this is uh, an ordinance to regulate any and all uses that are in violation of federal, state, uh, local laws, um, but obviously uh, the originator of this discussion um, is the new uh, Michigan, Mar Mar Michigan Medical Marijuana Act, and as you recall, U.S. City Council enacted a moratorium, a six-month moratorium, a couple months ago on this so we could look at it, analyze it, and evaluate it, and then come back with a recommendation w in which we have. So, just a moment. I need some... Elevator music room. <laughs> I could well, I could sing, but mm. you can do a little soft shoe routine. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Do you want to do the pedestrian motion while you're boarding up? It'll be here just in just a second, I think. Yeah. <coughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe not. It's even closer. Don't you just love window seller? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, okay. You wouldn't have this problem if you had that one. I know. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I love those. Yeah. Totally idiot proof. Mm -hmm. 
this is probably why I like them. Yeah. <laughs> That was his choice. <coughs> Get out of here. How come they tell you how to spell that? But you've got a slideshow view shelf. Okay. Well, with further ado, I'm going to turn over to the Chief and then we're going to tag team on this. Me neither. What I'm going to do is go through, uh, we have several slides here, so I'm going to try to go through them as quickly as I can uh, so that you have an understanding of what we're talking about. <clears throat> the current law, uh, marijuana is classified as a Schedule I drug under the Michigan Public Health Code. Schedule I drug uh, under the Board of Pharmacy finds the substance is a high potential for abuse, has no accepted medical use and treatment of the United States, or lacks accepted safety for use and treatment under medical supervision. If I can figure out how to change slides, here we go. <coughs> I'm, not, I'm not too computer savvy. <coughs> federal law, first offender convicted of possession of marijuana can be punished by a sentence of zero to one year in federal prison, mandatory fine of $1,000. Uh, and there was a case, Gonzalez versus Reich, uh, it was a case in which the United States Supreme Court ruled that under the Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution, Congress may ban the use of cannabis even where states have approved it for medical use. Uh, this just shows the potency, how it's gone up for, from less than 4% potency THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, I believe, uh, which is the active ingredient. It was less than 4% in 1983, and in 2008, it's 10.1%, uh, so it's, it's gaining in potency. Traffic deaths, of course, were, have been up for driving under the influence of drugs in the past several years. Michigan Mar Medical Marijuana Act, November of uh, 2008, the voters approved by a ballot initiative and legalized medical marijuana. On December 4th, the Michigan marijuana, medical marijuana law took effect. The law requires the Michigan Department of Community Health to implement the rules within 120 days. On April 4th, the uh, Michigan Department of Community Health adopted the rules to implement the act. Chief, can I ask a quick question? Yes. Um, back on, uh, under federal law and a mandatory fine of $1,000, how come it's not $1,000 in Ann Arbor? Well, because the federal government won't step in for small amounts and, and do with anything. They certainly could, but they just won't. So the $25 is okay? Yeah. Well, okay. They, they, it's a small enough amount that they don't care about it. But if the federal government comes in and arrests somebody in Ann Arbor for 10 pounds of marijuana, they're going to get charged <laughs> with, with the uh, one year. Okay. All right. Thank you. Essential elements of the program, it permits the use of marijuana for patients with qualifying medical conditions. It requires the Michigan Department of Community Health to maintain a registry of individuals authorized to use or assist with the use of medical marijuana. It sets limits on the amounts of marijuana an individual can possess and identifies qualifying medical conditions. It requires physicians to certify uh, a certification of uh, qualifying medical conditions. They can't prescribe it, they just certify that the person has this illness that comes under the statute. What the program does not do, does not legalize the sale of marijuana to qualified patients or caregivers. It allows certification of qualifying medical condition by a health professional other than a physician, <coughs> legalizes use outside of Michigan, requires the trial of other therapeutic interventions first, prohibits concurrent use of other prescribed control substances, and invalidate Federal Control Substance Act that does not do any of that. <coughs> what is permitted? The acquisition, possession, cultivation, manufacture use, internal possession, delivery, transfer, or transportation of marijuana or paraphernalia relating to the administration of mar marijuana to treat or alleviate a registered qualifying patient's debilitating medical condition 
or symptoms associated with a debilitating medical condition. Pretty much covers everything. Qualifying medical conditions, cancer, glaucoma, HIV, AIDS, hepatitis C, whatever that next one is, <laughs> Crohn's disease, agitation of Alzheimer's disease, nail patella, or the treatment of these conditions, the treatment of chronic debilitating disease or medical conditions or a treatment that produces one or more of the following, which is a wasting syndrome, severe or chronic pain, which is sort of a catch-all, uh, severe nausea, seizures such as epilepsy, severe or persistent muscle spasms such as multiple sclerosis. Role of the Michigan Department of Community Health to create a confidential registry of individuals who meet the definition of a qualified patient who could use marijuana for medical purposes or are designated as the primary caregiver for a qualified patient. Approve additions to the list of qualifying medical conditions so they can add more to that list. Registration process, newer renewal applications are $100. A reduced fee of $25 is available to individuals currently participating in Medicaid or receiving <coughs> Social Security insurance benefits. And approximately 60% of the applicants are now paying the reduced fee. The Department of Community Health has 15 days to approve or deny an application and an additional five days to issue the card. Applications are reviewed within the 15 days of receipt. Incomplete applications are denied and applicants are then notified by denial of, by certified and regular mail. The Michigan um, Medical Marijuana Act currently allows for a copy of the application submitted to serve as a valid registry of identification if the card is not issued within, 100, within 20 days of its submission to the department. The Department of Community Health is not currently in compliance regarding reviewing and approving within 15 days. Even with three full-time uh, employees working 40 hours a week. So basically uh, people file for it in the 15 day period, they, it can't be done. So. <coughs> Registration is good for one year, must reapply each year by submitting a completed application form, fee, and a physician certification form. A person under 18 can be registered if two physicians certify the medical condition, parent or guardian consents to allow the use, parent or guardian agrees to be the primary caregiver, parent or guardian agrees to control acquisition, dosage, and frequency of use. <coughs> Department of Community Health has granted a card to a child as young as five years old. Caregiver requirements. The patient identifies the individual as their primary caregiver on the registration application form. The primary caregiver must be 21 years of age or older, have no felony convictions involving illegal drugs, agree to assist <coughs> patient with medical use of marijuana. Caregivers may also be registered qualified patients. The role of the physician. Participation is voluntary for physicians. The primary role is to complete the physician certification <coughs> that the patient was evaluated. The patient has one or more qualifying medical conditions, the potential for therapeutic or palliative benefit. Physician is not prescribing marijuana or recommending it. It is illegal for physicians to prescribe marijuana. Possession limits. How much marijuana can a qualifying patient possess? 2.5 ounces of usable marijuana, excluding seeds, stalks, and roots. 12 marijuana plants kept in an enclosed locked facility, which is really not very well defined. Caregiver can only possess marijuana if designated to do so by a qualifying patient. 2.5 ounces of usable marijuana excludes seed stalks and roots. 12 marijuana plants kept in an enclosed locked facility. No more than five patients per caregiver. Note, caregivers can also be qualified patients. 
and a maximum of 15 ounces of uniform, usable marijuana and 72 marijuana plants total. How does one acquire marijuana? The Act is totally silent on this issue. The state is not authorized to regulate growing sites or quality of product under the Act. State and federal restrictions on selling marijuana do exist. Medical concern. There is a lack of clinical research on the therapeutic properties. Lack of standardization of ingredients or potency. Limit, limited information on dosing or routes of delivery. Potential drug to disease and drug to drug interactions. Limited data to support the use of marijuana for most conditions. Note that there is clinical data to support use for HIV wasting, appetite stimulation, chemotherapy introduced nausea and vomit, vomiting. Potential liability, since the quantity and quality may be outside physician's control, there may be adverse cumulative effects. Chief Button, excuse me. Yes. On the fourth bullet point, I apologize, define drug-to-drug -drug interactions. Um, they would, their marijuana is a drug and they could be taking other prescribed medication <coughs> that it could have a reaction with. Okay. And it's, it, that's uncontrolled, basically. Thank you. Protection for physicians, there's a good faith protection for physicians against medical board or law enforcement actions if a complaint, if compliant with the intent of the act. <clears throat> Suggested best practice, presence of a medical record, evidence of evaluation, documentation supporting presence, presence of qualifying medical condition. Possible licensing con concerns for a physician. Possible disciplinary action by a medical board for failure to properly evaluate the patient. Failure to establish qualifying medical condition. Falsifying a certification. Being a part of what's known as a certification mill. Impact of practicing under the influence. The potential for discipline in other states where medical uses are not legal. Employment concerns. Permit or prohibit employment of a permit holder. Uh, that was not addressed. Obligation to accommodate uh, ingestion in the workplace or working while under the influence. Obligation to accommodate employees under ADA. Note, it does, does not require the employer to accommodate the use of marijuana. However, it's unclear if the employer has to retain, hire, or hire employees if they do not partake during working hours. Also, the question of what is under the influence. Unanswered questions in the, in the statute. What constitutes a public place? What is a locked, enclosed facility? What does it mean to be in the presence or vicinity of the medical marijuana use? What about exposure to secondhand smoke? When is someone under the influence? And many, many more questions have not come up yet. Yes. Oh, I, I, well, maybe, I don't mean to put you on the spot. But no, that's fine. When, when people in presentations put many, many more and then don't define many, many more. Yeah. And that's, that's, this was a presentation that we actually copied this slide from somebody else and many, many more. Would to me mean that this law is undefined until there are some court challenges and things will come up that were unforeseen that will be <coughs> defined by the courts at a later time. Okay. I didn't mean to be argumentative. No, no, Chief, no, I was that's just curious. okay. That, that's quite okay. I had, the, I had the same question that I really don't know the answer to. Okay. Program statistics. Applications received as of March 19th, 2010. There were 21,721 applications received since April 6, 2009. 11,261 patients registered. 4,905 caregivers <coughs> registered. 3,329 applications denied. And the reason for denial typically is that the applicant application is incomplete, missing a photo, 
missing physician certification application form. It's just incomplete uh, or with insufficient fees. Uh, they do require a photograph to be submitted that's supposed to be a part of the card that they carry. None of the cards have photographs on them. I think the technology isn't there yet to do that. Uh, so when we get a card, uh, if that's all they have, we're not sure who we're dealing with. Uh, some denied because of medical conditions not covered, such as depression. An average of 80 plus applications are received each day. Top qualifying medical conditions, severe nausea, severe chronic pain, severe and persistent muscle spasms. Experiencing increase in the number of physicians completing evaluations. Who or what to control? The Michigan Medical Marijuana Act discusses patients, caregivers, physicians, others, dispensaries, cannabis or compassion clubs, etc. How to control, there's three approaches. You can do nothing and just wait and see what happens. You can prohibit or ban it, or you can regulate it. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Cantwell that's gonna finish this up. Thank you, Chief. I'll try and get, get through this uh, quick as well. Um, but just, just as a clarification, um, under the, uh, as far as who or what to control, and the, it says others, question mark, dispensaries, cannabis, or compassion clubs, Question mark, those are not covered, those are not addressed in the current language. So that, that's why those are question marks. Um, and just as a, a point, I forgot to, to address it in the, in, the, uh, in the introduction of the program. Um, the, three, uh, the three programs that, that, that uh, we've made into this one is from the uh, Michigan Department of Community Health. They put on, that's one of them, that's where a lot of the information that Chief Button just uh, mentioned. Uh, also from the city of Troy and the city of Grand Rapids. And that's, uh, again, that's where we're, we're going to talk right now. But um, zoning is, is one way to do it, regulation. And why zoning? Obviously, you have local control, authority uh, to regulate uh, individual land uses, um, be proactive uh, as far as any problem prevention, and hopefully reduce some of the impacts on the community. The community determines the best approach. Uh, considerations for each of the neighborhoods, of course, ability to manage the change, uh, and works in concert with other public health, safety, and welfare uh, regulations. Um, zoning authority, the use, uh, operations, and design, that's, uh, those are the obviously the authorities that, that uh, if we're going to regulate it through zoning, uh, affords a community. Obviously, layered regulations, they have the Zoning Enabling Act, uh, as well as, obviously, now this would include the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. Um, balance of interest, just like with any use that uh, the planning and zoning uh, have to deal with, the, the individual rights, uh, privacy of an individual, as well as the health, safety, and welfare of the entire community to consider. Um, some information from the Department of Community Health. Um, you see some cities are licensing the caregivers as home-based business operators, but it really should be kept up to the city and there's only administrators. Department of Community Health is not offering any type of advice on what to do. We just deal with the registration program. But what's good for Ann Arbor may not be good for Grand Rapids and what's good for Grand Rapids may not be good for Muskegon. And the reason I put that in there is that it depends on the individual community um, uh, and, and, and what their needs or wants are. Um, obviously do nothing uh, approach. Um, and for instance, the city of Troy, when I, uh, I say loosely that they've decided to do, do nothing, meaning that not to adopt, uh, they're basically saying, at least, at least as of uh, March or April when these presentations were given, um, their standard response is it's against federal law, so we, we can't consider it anyway. And that's basically they sent out when they, somebody requested, they sent their city attorney's office sends out a letter saying, <coughs> You know, we can't take any action either way because it's against federal law. So, but they have not, at, at that point in time, they may, have, they may have since, but they have not adopted any kind of language either way, uh, prohibiting it or regulating it. Um, so obviously you could just allow the Medical Marijuana Act to operate on its own, regard noncompliance as law enforcement issue. Uh, interpretation of the act still is still required. Uh, undesirable, unregulated use uh, could develop if not addressed. 
can I generally mitigate for adverse secondary impacts uh, after the fact? So if, if you allowed, if you didn't do anything, and and then, uh, for instance, some were able to set up some operations, if you will, for lack of a better term, and then at a later point wanted to uh, not allow, then those ones would already be grandfathered in typically. Um, Non-conforming rights issues, if regulation is desired at a later date, is it just like uh, advertising on a billboard, for instance? Um, not addressed. Uh, we talked a little bit about this, but health or safety requirements, reporting requirements, various methods of use, uh, methods of how it's dispensed, as we talked about that. It's, uh, in federal law, it's against federal law to sell. It's, it's uh, even the seeds, if you will. Um, so one of the questions is, at least in the law enforcement community, is well, how, how do you legally purchase the seeds to, to, to start the plants, to grow the plants? Um, locations, you know, do you, do you allow it, you know, in your neighbor, in your residential neighborhoods? Do you allow it downtown? Do you put it out in the industrial park? Um, how, how do you, well, what spots do you put it in? Of course, hours of operation, uh, distance from schools, parks, et cetera, conf uh, obviously, again, conflicts with federal law. Uh, prohibit. Um, City of Grand Rapids has chosen to, um, uh, there, well, let me back up here. Prohibit considerations. The, the, the considerations that City of Grand Rapids went through to consider whether or not to prohibit it or regulate it. Um, of course, obviously, again, citing the non-compliance with federal law, um, 15 West Michigan municipal attorneys agreed that prohibition uh, would likely be difficult to defend, and 66% of City of Grand Rapids residents voted in favor of the uh, Michigan Medical Marijuana Act at the uh, Nove November 2008 elections. Um, of course, also uh, various distribution methods, lack of direction in the act. Um, uh, it is very vague in, in a number of places. Uh, <coughs> challenges experienced by other communities. Uh, desires to provide reasonable access to medical marijuana. Potential impacts on the general character of the community. Shrinking public safety resources. Um, again, more considerations, location information, citing, ability to enforce and monitor. Uh, distribution to non-patients, third-party intermediaries, group use of marijuana, that's where those uh, um, compassion clubs uh, that I mentioned before, the dispensaries um, or the cannabis clubs have come into question. Um, large use is in a clear violation of federal law uh, if it becomes a large grow operation. Of course, there's other states. California is, is a big one. I believe Washington as well. Um, Washington, I believe, is similar to, to Michigan's law, and California is, is different in, in, in a number of ways, but um, activity is already occurring. Um, prohibit City of Livonia ordinance, and that's just as a note, that's where our city staff's uh, recommendation is drafted from, is modeled after the City of Livonia, and used for enterprises or purposes that are contrary to federal, state, or local laws, ordinances are prohibited. Excuse me. Um, regulate considerations, various distribution methods. Again, similar, some of the same questions about prohibiting uh, um, challenges experienced uh, by their communities, uh, desire to provide reasonable access to medical marijuana, potential impacts, uh, shrinking public safety resources. Again, all these are the same same items that need to be considered for, for any of these three types. Um, of course, types of uses: dispensary, cooperatives, compassion clubs, medical clinics, or pharmacies and caregivers. Um, Ordinance goals, to be able to enforce, defend, and protect. Protect the community, prevent negative effects, create reasonable re regulations with defensible rationale, clear and simple, and avoid the shades of gray. We can do that. Uh, intent of the act, um, permit legally qualifying patients to legally use and possess medical marijuana for pain relief, nausea, or other de debilitating medical condition, allow an intimate caregiver-patient relationship. And that's the other thing just wanted to as Chief Button was talking about some of the, the requirements, they, the act requires a what's called a bona fide uh, doctor-patient relationship, meaning that they can't just go in and say, uh, uh, hey doctor, I, th I think I have chronic pain, and the <coughs> doctor says, okay, you got chronic pain, here's your certif here's, I'll sign your certification for the application. They're supposed to examine them, you know, literally, you know, do, you know, poke, prod, however, whatever verbs you would like to use, but have it. Uh, a bona fide is the term that they use relationship and I know from the presentation the C Department of Community Health did that's one of the other challenges they're having is if there's complaints against doctors that are doing something other than that and at the time of course they couldn't mention names obviously but there were, they did have a complaint against a doctor 
from uh, a sister of a uh, person that has a medical marijuana card, medical marijuana card, um, because she knows that that I mean she's made the complaint to the state saying I know there's no way that this they have a bona fide uh, relationship, uh, patient uh, doctor patient relationship. I know he didn't do a full uh, analysis um, of, of my brother and and uh, so at that point in time again this was in uh, March or April. They are trying to determine how best to evaluate that. So again, a number of un and that's why it's so murky because as, as Chief Button also alluded to, there's um, there's not any case law at this point in time. And just like anything, especially something this potentially um, uh, high interest, controversial, um, there's probably <coughs> going to be a lot of in the next few years. I would imagine there's going to be a, a fair amount of case law um, that will come up. Uh, not a retail use purpose is sale of marijuana, but allows payment for service. What I mean by that is, um, if you have a caregiver and you're utilizing a caregiver, you cannot pay them for that service. I mean, to me, it's a matter of semantics. But you cannot pay them for this. I'm sorry, you cannot pay them for the marijuana, but you can pay them for the service. So, um, again, issues, location, group use of marijuana, um, zoning approval methods by right. Meaning, is it permitted or is it a special land use? Uh, and for those that permitted use is, means that as long as it's, it uh, complies with a list of uh, conditions um, uh, or standards, then it auto is automatically it's uh, by right, as it says there. Um, it's allowed by right, as opposed to a special land use, which allows um, uh, more uh, more authority for the planning commission uh, and the city council. Uh, to to uh, put to, to review it and and uh, put more standard more conditions on it, if you will, um, because it, because of this particular use. Um, so by right, it can go anywhere within a signed zone district, no limit on number. Allow within a specified zone district. Uh, can apply can apply performance standards, but not, there's ones that are already in place in the zoning ordinance. As long as they comply by those, it's by right. Um, Again, any performance standard should be reasonably related to the potential negative effects resulting from a specific use. Um, issues that, that by right uh, use comes with is, is the designated area large enough not to be exclusionary? Are sufficient uh, protections provided? Performance measures can be difficult to implement without additional oversight. No retraction if there are problems. Will law enforcement be able to manage? And what will the neighbors think? Um, Special land use, uh, again, allow within a specified zone district with special approval granted from planning commission and city council, public hearing, notification of persons with 300 feet, um, approval to now based upon standards, conditions may be applied and enforced. And I can't, um, I can't remember if I have another slide on this, but the special, the other thing you want to go, uh, the, uh, the, the list of people that have these, these cards um, is confidential. And so I, police, can, can get that, are supposed to be able to get that list. The, list the, the person, the, the individual person. But other than that, um, so for instance, with special land use, as it says here, um, we're required by state law to send out uh, letters within 300 feet to all the property owners within 300 feet of this specified location. The question is, would that violate, which I believe it would, the confidentiality requirement of the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act? And so that's another reason why. Uh, Grand Rapids has chosen to do it by by right, I believe, uh, permitted use. Um, but that's because they're saying we really can't, even if we wanted to do it, we couldn't because it violates the, the state act. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, standards, neighborhood. Of course, here's some standards that you would typically consider no <coughs> lights contained on site, compatible with the existing character, supports <coughs> pedestrian oriented environment. Public facilities, adequate infrastructure, uh, complies with all applicable codes, alcohol concentration. Um, these are just some potential standards with special land use. Um, in issues, there's no correct number of facilities. How do you prove detriment? Uh, what is oversaturation? Why would neighbors support public notice requirements that may, may violate privacy and uh, may endanger <coughs> patients or caregivers? 
justification. There's not any case law in Michigan, as I mentioned, to support justification at this point of banning or regulating. Uh, other methods, business license uh, and use variants. Uh, use regulations, types of uses, dispense. This is the question, as I mentioned before. Dispensaries, cooperatives, compassion clubs, medical clinics and pharmacies, caregivers. Dispensaries, again, no mention um, in the Act, in the Michigan Act. Um, so as, as I mentioned earlier, Grand Rapids does not uh, allow them. Uh, there's nothing that, that uh, regulates them. California amended its 96 state law in 2004 to specifically allow for cooperatives. <coughs> and Washington State provides for patients and caregivers, but no, no co-ops or dispensaries. And of course, the question uh, what would be the method to, to approve it uh, under zoning? In compassion clubs um, would fall under an assembly, special land use in Grand Rapids, uh, education, dispensary, private club, smoking, what would, what would it fall under? Uh, medical clinics and pharmacies, federal government classifies as <coughs> beginning as a Schedule One drug, which means that licensed medical practitioners and pharmacists cannot prescribe or distribute it. Physician may only provide written certification of a debilitating medical condition for medical marijuana use, uh, potential to allow um, subletting of space or have other s uh, staff service caregivers. Um, that was an idea. Um, Pharmacies, again, is this, are not allowed to, uh, to dispense it either. Um, when does a clinic become a dispensary? The City of Grand Rapids decided to prohibit dispensaries, cooperatives, growth facilities, and compassion clubs, and allow registered caregivers to operate as a home occupation, uh, essentially allowing only the small personal service the Act contemplates. Caregivers as home occupation, small in scope, meets the intent of the Act, provides protection, for, as well as from law enforcement, protects occupants from potential hazards, uh, it's not exclusionary, provides access and availability, recognizes existing conditions with improved safety measures, patients, patient privacy is protected. Uh, home occupations, again, licensed by city clerk, limited hours of operation, employees prohibited, so it's the, you have the one caregiver, um, and again, the, the act uh, does not allow any employees. Person must reside at property, and property owner's signature must be obtained. Uh, state law recognizes piano teachers, family, child care, and adult foster care family homes by right. More rules uh, for caregiver and closed lock facility to be inspected by the police department. And these, again, this is this is Grand Rapids, and these inspections would be prior to a certificate of occupancy to to be allowed to to or or a license granted uh, for someone in, in a home. Um, and again, the, the concern is one of the, the lax definitions is, you know, what is an enclosed lock facility? Um, so to be inspected by police, inspections and approval required by building and fire officials, electric, uh, HVAC, chemical storage, fire prevention, et cetera, not permitted within 1,000 feet of schools, one caregiver per partial, not more than five patients per week. So that would basically mean that, so you couldn't have five people coming in on Monday, another five coming <coughs> Tuesday, another five, et cetera. So the law says five <coughs> patients. Uh, additional information, um, compensation for the registered primary caregiver. You may receive uh, for costs associated with assisting the registered, but not for the, sa not for the sale of controlled substance. Um, where it's prohibited under the act, uh, smoking marijuana in any public place, smoking marijuana in any form of public transportation, any use by a person who has no serious or deep dental medical <coughs> condition, operating, navigating, or being in actual physical control uh, of any motor vehicle, aircraft, motor boat, et cetera, while under the influence, any use of possession in a school bus, any use of possession on the grounds of any preschool, primary, any use of possession in correctional facility. About the plants, again, we talked about this, the size, does not limit the size. Um, Caregiver can cultivate 12 marijuana plants per patient for up to five patients. Uh, does not set any parameters to know uh, how much a caregiver can charge for their services. Um, again, 12 plants can produce quite a bit of marijuana. Annual yield of 12 plants indoor marijuana grow site would generate between 44 and 72 ounces. Um, it can be assumed that the primary caregiver is not legally allowed to keep part of the harvest as payment. Um, again, concerns about the act. Does not specify how patients and caregivers would acquire marijuana for medical purposes. Uh, 
profiteering, potential, I should say, potential profiteering, regulating, prohibiting medical marijuana dispensaries through ordinances, um, exposure to federal prosecution, medical marijuana in jails, defendant on probation or parole, children's daycare centers, adult foster care homes, nursing homes, colleges, university, school zones, one place, <coughs> PCW, uh, or permit holders. Uh, recent legislation, uh, State Senator Wayne Kuyper has recently has introduced legislation that would treat medical marijuana as any other Schedule II drug, would require a doctor's prescription with the drug sold only through a pharmacist, and they would license 10 growers statewide to provide medical marijuana to pharmacists. And it should be noted any changes in the law would require a three-quarter majority vote in both uh, state chambers, the House and Senate. And lastly, this is the last one, just so you know. Um, again, city staff recommendation is to amend the zoning ordinance to not allow use by prohibiting any all uses that are contrary to federal, state, or local laws uh, per language from our city attorney, Mr. Grossman. Again, it's adopted, mirrored from the uh, city of Livonia. And uh, as of about a month ago, three weeks ago, uh, city of East Point, city of Novi, and some other South Michigan communities were considering, I'm not sure, if we're, did it so, so again, thank you. I apologize for the length of this, but we want I, reason it's so long. I wanted you to see all the facets, not just one side or the other, but the whole thing, um, to let you know why we're recommending the way we are. Because there are so many unanswered questions, and you know, at some point, if it does become uh, legalized federally, then again, we would address it at that point. But that has been kind of our. Our focus, our intent is to say, it, because it is against federal law <coughs> currently, um, and there's still so many, so many unanswered questions um, that this is, we believe this is the, the best route to take. Are there any questions for City Manager Campbell or Chief Button? Thank you. Oh, Mr. Rhodes. I had um, one question, and that is, what, could you explain to me what the difference is between our prohibition via the zoning ordinance and the statement that uh, from Grand Rapids that said 15 West Michigan municipal attorneys agreed their prohibition would likely be difficult <coughs> to defend. So we're prohibiting here, aren't we? We would propose that, yes. Yeah. I, I would let, What's the uh, difference there? Uh, in answer to your question, uh, the, the uh, land use regulation by cities is a well-established uh, concept. <coughs> which is upheld by the courts uh, and uh, by using the, the zoning ordinance, the land use section of the zoning ordinance, you're not prohibiting directly. You're simply saying hey, what, what, we, what we're proposing here is all uses contrary to federal, state, or local law um, are prohibited. It is, and and it's, it's not uh, focused on this particular thing, mm -hmm. if, 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 in, under our ordinance, uh, if we 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 we, can, we have the authority to regulate land uses, we have a section to that effect. All we're doing here is adding a subparagraph D onto the, the section, which says which you, which land uses are prohibited. Okay. And that's what, all we're doing here. If we simply passed an ordinance saying it's it's it's. Uh, prohibited, it probably would be illegal. But certainly, if, if the question of does the city of Saline or any other home rule city have the authority to regulate land uses in the community, the answer is clearly yes. And it's been tested many times in court. <coughs> now, as, as Mr. Campbell says, if the federal law ever changes and becomes, makes, makes marijuana legal, then our ordinance loses its, its potency, and we'll have to revisit the problem. But we're saying for now, as long as there is that, that uh, dichotomy, uh, that, that the fact that the federal law uh, is, is, is state marijuana use, possession, and sale, and so forth, is, is illegal, in fact, a felony. And the, the, the first question under this uh, comes to, to any city attorney saying, do we have the authority to do anything contrary to federal law? And some, some attorneys have simply said, and that comes under the heading, do nothing. 
some some attorneys have said we don't have to do anything because as as uh, home rule city attorneys we have no authority to pass any law which is contrary to a federal law now that's not been tested in court but that's that's their position so when somebody is, applies for um, the right to do this in their community, those attorneys simply say, you can't do it because it's against federal law and we, we can't approve anything that's against the federal law. But that approach is probably not as safe legally as simply adding to the category of, of prohibited uses under the land use statute of our zoning ordinance, adding uh, a <coughs> that says uh, we prohibit uh, any use, land use, that is in violation with the federal law. No, it certainly seems like a worthwhile uh, attempt. I, I foresee some pretty lively court issues coming up over the next year or two on this whole matter. Okay, so we had no more questions for staff. No. And we have a motion, item 1051. This is a proposed ordinance number 727, <coughs> prohibiting uses for enterprises or purposes that are contrary to federal, state, or local laws or ordinances. So be a motion to acknowledge receipt of the June 1st, 2010 memo from the Saline City Planning Commission to acknowledge receipt and reading of ordinance number 727, an ordinance to amend Article 4, zoning, dis zoning district regulations of the City of Saline zoning ordinance to prohibit uses for enterprises or purposes that are contrary to federal, state, or local laws or ordinances to prove and adopt or not adopt ordinance number 727 <coughs> as submitted. We have a motion. Move to approve and adopt. Second. Move moral. Second, Ivy, to approve and adopt. Discussion. All in favor, say aye. That's all right. Sorry. That's all right. Wait, sorry, Mr. No, Morrell. that's all right, Mayor. Go ahead. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Item 1096 is proposed ordinance number 728, pedestrians crossing streets. This is a motion to acknowledge receipt of the May 24th, 2010 memo from City Superintendent Engineer Rubel to acknowledge receipt and reading ordinance number 728 in ordinance to amend the Michigan <coughs> Vehicle Code as adopted by reference by City of Saline ordinance number 622 to provide for rules and regulations regarding pedestrians crossing streets to approve and adopt or not adopt ordinance number 728. Move to approve and adopt. Move roads. Second. Second ping. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> uh, do we have any commissioner committee reports from council members? If not, we'll move on to reports and other announcements. Our first concert is this Friday night downtown. Correct? Yes, yes it is. Ms. Pink, did you have anything? I have a question for um, City Assessor Skull and her memo, her report. Yeah, we're gonna, that's next. We're still on reports and announcements. <laughs> did you have a report or an announcement? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mr. Morrow. Um, this Sunday there's a community event, Mayor, um, I believe at Liberty School. It is an <coughs> autism awareness rally and walk. I believe it takes place from 1 to 4, and the actual walk portion begins at 2. Um, and autism awareness, that issue is very important. It's being debated um, uh, lively in, in Lansing and in Washington. It's important that we do something to, to treat and, and hopefully in the future prevent this disease. So if you have time, please come out again this Sunday at Liberty School between 1 and 4. Okay. And is there any other reports and or announcements? Mr. Rhodes. Un under um, announcements, um, in the last issue of the SEMCOG magazine, there was a, um, an article about their new sustainable community recognition program. And I don't know if we have... Um, what our intentions are to uh, apply to that, but I would hope that we would, because in going down the list looking at their 16 criteria, we've done enough of those to already get recognized. So as long as we've gone through the effort, we might as well get the recognition. And then the next thing I have the um, information from the current uh, Sitting Leadership Institute, class number 13 where they did a SWAT, Strengths, Weakness, Opportunities, and Threats exercise, and then also did a vision for Selene in the year 2015. So I have copies here for council members to uh, look at, and you'll see some new information on there, and you'll see some information that's been on there for a number of years. It just keeps showing up over and over again. 
Um, some things we have uh, moved forward on and some we've not been able to. And one thing to uh, recall with this particular uh, SWAT exercise is that this is a group of people who came together for the first time at a retreat. <clears throat> some of them are uh, residents of our city and some are not. Some, some work here and live elsewhere. And um, so you could, could look at some of those comments perhaps with a grain of salt. The last thing that I have is a map that has just been produced on historical Washtenaw area attractions. And City of Saline is in there, uh, I think, three times. <coughs> so, and those maps are available at the library and at both of the Historic Society locations. Mr. Little. Uh, July 16 and 17, Sling Celtic Festival. Um, it's going to be it's a bargain for any family entertainment. And it um, is, uh, and if anyone's interested in volunteering, uh, and or attending, go to the uh, festival website at slingcelticorg and get all the information. It's going to be a good festival. <coughs> so any other reports or announcements? Okay, um, yes, uh, our city assessor, Catherine, well, um, there was, uh, if you could come up to the microphone, there were some questions at the last council meeting regarding, from a citizen regarding extending the period uh, for the Board of Review from the date of the notices and you know, did some research and put together a memo for Council and um, I'm, I don't know if you want to have her give the report and then ask the question. That'd be acceptable? Okay. Thank you. I don't have much of a report and it's late so you'll probably appreciate that. Um, I, I tried to outline in the memo that I provided to Todd and to City Council the uh, time constraints and the calendar that is set by state law and also by city charter that dictate um, the timing of the Board of Review and also some of the other things that lead up to the Board of Review and the posting of notices. Um, it's the General Property Tax Act that uh, identifies the dates for the Board of Review. Townships actually hold their Board of Review the second week or the second Monday in March. We are ruled by city charter, which actually gives us one additional week. So if you read in the newspapers around that time, the townships are a week earlier <coughs> than we are. So we actually have the luxury of having an extra week um, prior to our Board of Review. Our city charter requires that our Board of Review is held the, for the third Monday of March and we continue with meetings uh, <coughs> Tuesday and Wednesday and then as, as necessary throughout that week. The uh, assessment role actually is comprised of both real property and personal property assessments and probably most property owners uh, would not even be aware of what personal property assessments are. They're a big portion of our city role in our total um, valuation. <coughs> Personal property would be assessments, or the personal property assessments are assessments on assessable business equipment. Businesses are required to file a personal property statement with each assessing office by February 20th. Uh, that is part of the state law. So while the, the statements actually say on them to be filed by the 1st, the statutory deadline is February 20th, and in fact it actually is they have to be postmarked by February 20th. So we are scrambling like crazy to finish all of that and print the assessment roll, all the reports that go to council and to equalization and print all of the assessment notices. We hold our organizational board of review meeting. We do all that within a couple of days. And we get the notices to the mailer. This year we had the notices to the mailer on February 24th, and they were mailed out by the end of February. Um, it was suggested that there be a 30-day time frame, which sounds completely reasonable, and, and all of us assessing people would, would really appreciate that. In fact, there is a uh, proposed House bill currently before the legislature that is suggesting that as well, to change the current 10-day minimum requirement to a minimum of 30 days. That would be terrific. The problem is that they would have to move the dates back either on the front end with regards to personal property deadline 
or on the back end with the dates that we have to finish the role after Board of Review, submit it to county equalization for their equalization process and then the state equalization period. So um, be all for it. If anybody wants to try to, to get that changed, uh, if there's any leeway there, that'd be fantastic. I think the only thing that, that we can do, and we do have an FYI article going out in the July edition that uh, you know, tries to address this, lets people know it's going to be the same time every year. It is in March, and there really isn't a lot of time, but you can know that it's coming. You will get your assessment notice by the end of February. We might be able to scooch it up a little bit more, but with that February 20th deadline, there really just isn't any possibility to move it beyond that because the assessment role has to be certified as a whole and the personal property is a major component of that. Um, but all year long we're here and we have much more time to help people and to go over files than we, than we may actually in March when we're in front of everybody's eye. So um, there are things that people can do ahead of time. They can come in, ask questions. They can go through their files. They can review last year's assessment if they have questions as well. So questions. we'll do what we can. Ms. Payne. Um, thank you for this report. Um, this is great, and hopefully we can make sure that the gentleman who questioned this gets a copy of it. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that we are going to put in the FYI. Maybe we can put it in twice or move it back to the fall when it will um, address more along the lines of when it would be appropriate. And then <coughs> it is always the same time, but I think that people aren't really sure always what to bring. So maybe if you could say these are documents that you should have ready if this is something that you're preparing to do because if you wait, you might not have enough time to do this. But these are things that we typically see when people are whatever. So people know that you know they can, they can do a little bit of the work that if they're planning on making an appeal of some sort, what kind of documentation that they would need ahead Absolutely. of time. Absolutely. And, and the first thing that, that every homeowner should do, every property owner should do, is be familiar with how their property is assessed in the first place. And that would be just a, a quick review of their file to come on in any time they're in anyways and just request uh, a copy of that or just ask to have it you know, reviewed. Um, we can also go over all of the sales data that we did use and we'll, we'll be compiling that. We don't have all of that together now, but we can certainly help people with questions and concerns and they can go over their file. We do have uh, already have things on our website that are um, contained in the frequently asked questions section. Um, I can make sure that we, you know, vamp it up a little bit more again in the fall so that we address this when it, you know, starts to get on people's minds again. Um, but there are things that people can do ahead of time. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Are there any other discussion? Oh, additional cemetery, cemetery space. space. Diane, mm -hmm. city clerk. Or is it Team Andrew Campbell? It's me. Okay. It's me. You have before you a copy of the map of one section of our cemetery. And we had a request from um, a citizen who owns some spaces in that area um, who has need for another space. And there is a large green space area there. This area is, if you look to the right of your map, um, Michigan Ave would be to the north there, and if you took the entrance in off of Michigan Ave, the area that you see um, penciled in um, is to the right of that roadway in. And um, Gary and I went down on site, and um, we determined that we could, in fact, add 27 additional spaces there and make them available for sale. Um, and I just wanted to bring this before council this evening and see if that is agreeable to council to add these spaces. Um, currently we charge $1,400 per space and that would amount to $37,800 in revenue uh, just for the sale of the spaces and then we would have revenue for interments and also foundations that we would put on the sites for monuments. So we're just kind of 
seeing if you have a problem with it, if we can go ahead, or if you have questions, questions or any concerns. I, I'm kind of lost on the location. Where, where okay. Are we here? If, <coughs> if you look to the right of the page, Michigan Ave is out here. Where it says road, is that Michigan Ave? No, 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 no. That is the roadway in off of Michigan Ave. This is it. So this is fairly high up then? No, this is, no. there's only one entrance off of Michigan Ave. Mm -hmm. When you, and you would be driving in off Michigan Ave, and to your right is this green, large green grassy area. And that's where these spaces would be located. Which is near? Yeah, down here Michigan somewhere. Ave is here. Right. Pardon me? Oh, I don't know. I wasn't there. Which way? Which way? I'm sorry, I couldn't give you a, a they, they, more People detail. think this is Monroe, but this is a cemetery no. road. The, the road cemetery that is depicted road. is the road that comes in off of, or the driveway in off of Michigan Ave. Mr. Rubel, were you there? Yes. It, would no. this be the um, where the band was during the memorial ceremony? Is that where Are the band stands? No. 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 Well, I, the way I view it, the band looks like they're standing on the, the asphalt. This, so this is the area just behind the asphalt West driveway, of the asphalt. just inside the gate from Michigan Avenue. <laughs> so the driveway is fairly wide at that point, too. The mm -hmm. entrance drive is more than two lanes wide. It's about three lanes wide. So it would not interfere with traffic if, uh, or the band if, if we developed that space. Mr. Morrow. Um, I think it's, you know, well, let me take a step back. I'm really, you know, I've stated this before. I'm not really in favor of um, purchasing additional cemetery space, but whatever we can do in our existing Oakwood Cemetery to develop more um, plots, I think, is an excellent idea. Um, I think it's a testament to our clerk's department, and for those of you out there who, who don't know or aren't aware, we really have an outstanding clerk's department, so I applaud you for being proactive. Um, the only other thing is, and I mentioned this at the cemetery task force, I still would like to see something about adding cremains in the mausoleum. So I'm hoping that will come to us sometime in the future. But otherwise, I'm very supportive of this. Okay. Is there further questions on this? I don't think there's any issues, so. I, Sorry, Ms. Ping. I don't, I guess I still don't get where this is. It's where we were standing. Where? Yeah, so, so the so the road that it's on it goes up the hill. It's where the trees were in the flagpole. The flagpole and trees are down here. This is the road. This is Michigan Ave. Like if you're walking towards American Legion here, that comes in you were standing Ave, basically right on top of it on Monday. Okay, Mills Road is right here. This is the drive that comes in. Oh, and the trees are here. Podiums here. The trees and the podium are here. Yeah, oh. this is the, the larger roadway. Okay. And there's a large green grass area here. It's 14 feet, 21 feet. And this is I it's see. Okay, thank you. Any further questions for city clerk? <coughs> that sounds like everybody's okay with it. Thank you for studying this. Thank you. Coming up with another solution. <coughs> Uh, public comment under the Open Meetings Act. Any citizen may come forward at this time and may comment or question the City Council. This public comment period will be limited to three minutes per person. Anyone who would like to speak is requested but not required to state his or her address for the record. Mary Hess, 600 Canterbury. Senior citizen, and survivor of stage three cancer, the whole nine yards. I guess when we're paying for, as far as parades, when we're paying for parades, just remember if other municipalities aren't paying for them, there are going to be more coming here. I am, uh, I've asked questions and there was a question about the loose brick. I would have liked to have had an answer from the council regarding the pictures and the safety and the uh, ordinances as far as uh, getting our sidewalks repaired and maybe uh, taking a look again at that area of which there is only a very small path. For s There's nothing for safety on the, the area of uh, South Saline and Michigan Avenue. And uh, one of the council members said, Mary, you seem to be on the only one having the problem. And uh, if there's others that have a concern, maybe, you know, which kind of doesn't put much merit in my concern, <coughs> even though uh, I looked up quite a few areas of legal concern. And the loose brick is important because uh, I, I do want to know, and I do want it safe. 
And as far as the five and seven people, thousand people coming, uh, I love uh, to promote Celine, but I'm wondering how many Porter Johns you got and how many people will be urinating in the alleys or throwing up. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm a student at Celine High School. Uh, I just have a few questions. Uh, first question is, what is medical marijuana? Is that just marijuana? Could you elaborate on that, please? The, the Medical Marijuana Act, it's just regular marijuana. The act is, the, the law is called the Medical Marijuana Act. Okay. And then, um, the, who is, for the requirements, for the applicants uh, requesting for this medical, medical marijuana, who is, uh, who's, who's examining them? Is it the doctors or is it the pharmacists? A physician, yes. A physician? Okay. That, that's all. Thank you. Is there any other citizen comment? If not, uh, we need a motion to convene into closed session for the purpose of discussing the purchase of real estate. Uh, the city will convene, reconvene into regular session at the conclusion of the closed session. Well, you need a motion? So moved. Second. We wrote second law. We have a roll call vote. Councilmember Ping? Yes. Councilmember Rhodes? Yes. Councilmember Ivy? Yes. Councilmember Little? Yes. Councilmember Law? Yes. Councilmember Morrow? I'm sorry, yes. Mayor Driscoll? Yes. Adjourned a closed session at 938.